Hey, welcome to Speechless. We're glad to have you here uh, for this very interesting show. And I think the major question that I want people to call in about is whether we should have cameras in the courtroom in order to record the proceedings that are going on. Uh, we're going to discuss many other issues <laughs> on the show tonight, uh, basically based on a Dakota County court case that I was at today that was just fascinating beyond measure about the procedures and processes of evidence, uh, videos in the courtroom and the hallways, and how does that get preserved. So I think you will be, um, you, you'll gain a lot of information, but it's going to surprise you. And just the gamesmanship that goes on uh, that, you know, our prosecutors should care about justice. And when they know they're wrong, they need to let it go. And, and quit trying to protect people that shouldn't be protected. If you make a mistake, that's one thing, okay? Get over it, let it go, you know, move things along. You know, if you're a citizen in the United States, you make a mistake, you, make, you pay. And whether it's a traffic ticket, whatever, you know, there's, you know, taxation by citation, a whole number of venues in which you as a citizen, if, if you mess up a little bit, just a little bit, you have to pay. But not so with our government officials. If our government officials mess up, they get promoted a lot of times, or, or they, they don't pay, but are you as a citizen who expose it, you'll, get, you'll have to pay. And it just doesn't need to happen. And that is what is happening in Dakota County right now with a disorderly conduct charge against a man by the name of Don Mashek, who's been on this show, uh, who's a writer for the Minnesota Examiner, who was covering a number of cases in Dakota County and that day, so he's in and out of a number of different courtrooms because there's breaks and sometimes you're just waiting around, so you know you want to see certain things, so you go back and forth. Well, uh, okay, uh, the control room mic is up, <laughs> so <laughs> I, we didn't hear too much of that conversation. Uh, so you have all this. Um, so he gets arrested for disorderly conduct, and then what happens after that is just, it's just beyond the pal. It is not worth it. It's not worth being threatened for your life. It's not worth the cover-ups that are going on. It's not worth the prosecutor uh, not giving video to the last second, even though you've been asking for it and you've had it for a long, long time. So it, it, it's, it's fascinating uh, and then as a prosecutor, you've been told that the video's been destroyed. And you've told the defendant the video's destroyed. There is no record. Yet it shows up five days before an evidentiary hearing. Uh, some of it. Uh, fascinating. So uh, we're going to talk about that hearing today. We're also, and then that's going to tie into cameras in the courtroom and why cameras in the courtroom. And we're we'll talking a, a little bit again about the St. Paul School Board uh, public school board meeting where I spoke about the gender uh, inclusiveness policy um, w and spoke against it and then there was an article written and the article so I'm going to show you the video of what I said and I'm going to show you what the article said so this is a uh, dynamic thing uh, and in control room um, I only have the video up there because I grabbed the power cord on this one so you may want to grab one put one over there for the for the teleprompter uh, so uh, these we're, we're actually going to tie these in to show you what's going on in courtrooms uh, and some of the behind the scenes works of a courtroom but then also tie it into why it's important to have the video versus the written press or to have me talking and telling you what transpired. Because you're not going to get the whole picture. You're not going to get the full picture. You, you're going to get good pieces. I'm going to try to tell you the truth. I'm going to do everything I can to make it accurate. Uh, but sometimes it, it just doesn't come out right. You know, who, who knows what may happen? 
um, and or it's my opinion of what took place when that's not really what took place. So it's better that you get to see it with your own eyes. And that's the importance of the cameras in the courtroom. And there should have been a camera in this courtroom in Dakota County. It needed to be there so you could see what's going on. It, it was fascinating and disturbing and shocking as to what was taking place. And now you don't know, and it's only going to be filtered through me. Okay, and maybe Don Mashek will write a... Uh, an article on it, but you could have seen it for yourself, and I could have showed you clips of it, and you would have had a better idea of what was going on. Now I'm the filter. So, um, all right, let's let's get into this. Okay, so I already gave you a, a, a wind up on Don Mashek. Uh, I'm going to show you the video of what was given to him because. His statement all along was that he did not have any disorderly conduct. And there's a specific definition of disorderly conduct that I don't have written out for you right now. But it deals with swearing, uh, fighting, waving arms, and screaming and yelling. Uh, I mean, you know, this is excessive. You know, where it cause, causes uh, fear uh, of bodily harm. Uh, abusive or obnoxious behavior, um, and and one of the questions asked whether whether he was rude, and the and the police officer said, well, I mean the answer was no on all of those. He was just rude to speaking over the officer when the officer was trying to talk. Uh, so that's a whole interesting sideline in there. Did you know that officers? have to give you their name and badge number when you ask them. And so that was one of the cross-examinations of this very young officer, uh, or new to the police force, uh, uh, Sheriff Deputy Michael Vi, V-A-I. Uh, this was actually his first arrest for disorderly conduct, and I think it was his first arrest. He was three months into the business. And, and part of my being around the system, I think what happens is the, the older people try to compromise the younger people, uh, the new people, in order to have something on them. And they, and they put them in situations where they're given orders where the, the officer, the attorney, the public defender, whoever, gets compromised and they can always hang that over them. If you, if you don't do this, we're going to report this. If you do do this, we're going to, you know, that type of thing. You know, and I think he was actually set up. Uh, he seemed like a really nice guy. He wasn't trying, it just didn't seem like he was trying to lie or, you know, give any misinformation on this. Um, but yet, um, from all the other witnesses that were in the courtroom, his testimony was different. So the only thing he had is um, the police officer's, te uh, the sheriff's deputy testimony was this, and we're going to watch the video here. Uh, he told, he said he had a conversation with Don Mashek in the courtroom. And Don, in the courtroom, asked him what his name and badge number was before they got outside, and there was a brief conversation. What you're going to see in the video is that didn't take place. All you see is the, the deputy making some hand motions and telling Don to leave the room like this. And Don complies, and they go outside. And from, you know, so we don't see the whole video uh, of, of what took place in that room from once they leave the bench. Uh, but... The officer said they were talking, he talked with Don Mashek in the courtroom. So let's uh, watch this video here uh, from the beginning of the end. What you're going to see here, I don't know if you see my arrow, the sheriff's going to be sitting right over here. Don Mashek, what did I just do there? Uh, Don Mashek, this is Del Nathan here. Don is just on the other side, 
right there. So kind of all out of the picture for now, but they'll be in the picture. So there's no sound to this. But you know when they say that you can't have cameras in the courtroom? There it is. Okay, they have cameras in the courtroom. So let's play this. And I'll add my comments as we go. There's the sheriff saying, you know, shh. And then he gets up right away. And then he goes over and he says something. And then he points, then, he's, then he points, get out of the courtroom. I mean, it's all, all very quick, and Don complies and leaves. And that's pretty much what you're going to see in the courtroom. But I'm going to go back here and I want you to show this disorderly conduct here. Okay, we're going to, uh, yeah, we're still playing. But look at any, everybody in the courtroom is looking forward. The attorney, nobody's looking at the sheriff there. This person looks, just glances. No big deal. Judge's head down. Judges, you know, looks up. There's a discussion going on. Judge doesn't say anything. There was no, the judge didn't say, hey, you're in contempt, be quiet. Judge never told anybody in the crowd to be quiet. So Don leaves. And then eventually what you're going to see is Del Nathan here uh, get up and, and, and go out and look for Don. Yeah, and he doesn't go real fast there. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but Dell's testimony was Don was right there, um, tried to whisper something to him, and Dell said he couldn't hear what he was saying. And Dell's hearing is fine. He's an, he's an elderly man, but his hearing is fine. And then there's Dell coming back, uh, just. He was out there to check on Don, and uh, you know you can wa you walk in and out of these courtrooms all the time. The guy's given testimony. You see his hands waving here. He was given testimony during this time, and it just didn't bother the courtroom at all. So nothing was happening in the courtroom. Okay, I'm gonna. That's the outside the courtroom. We'll go back to that later, so you can come back here. So. <coughs> What had happened was, um, during this testimony, Don was in another courtroom in the morning, or was in the same courtroom in that morning, and one of the other sheriff's deputies had gone and told this Michael uh, uh, Vi to come watch this live footage, and he pointed out Don Mashek and and this is according to Michael Weiss' testimony that the other sheriff said, uh, watch this guy. Uh, he was handing papers and, and disrupting the court hearing in the morning, trying to hand a paper to, uh, it was in that courtroom, to the, the uh, person who was representing herself pro se, the person right in front of Don. So on the other side of Don was this other man, and he, he uh, but the sheriff's deputy accused Don of trying to hand a piece of paper, but it was actually the guy next to Don that tried to hand the pro se individual respondent plaintiff, she was both at the time, to the, uh, to the respondent plaintiff, but the, the sheriff said no, and so the man got up and handed the note to the sheriff to give to the respondent plaintiff. And the sheriff said, no, I'm not going to do that. Uh, all right, and then he goes sit down. No, no disruption, no disorderly conduct uh, took place. But the sheriff in the video said that it was Don that handed the paper and then to watch this guy. Okay, so this Michael Vi, in my opinion, was definitely on a alert out for this other man, uh, for Don Mashak, and wasn't, you know, uh, I don't know if he was ordered. I thought that would have been a good question for the uh, public defender to ask. Were you told to arrest him if he whispered to anybody? 
Whispering goes on in the courtrooms all the time, okay? It's just part of the deal. Sometimes things aren't heard that are said uh, up front, and people go, what, what did they say? And they whisper back and forth. It happens. If it gets too loud, and I've seen this happen, it gets too loud in the courtroom, a judge will say, you know, quiet down. We're giving testimony. You know, uh, try not to walk in and out of the courtroom so much. You, you know, they'll, they'll try to have control of the room. And in this case, testimony was given and nobody said anything. Okay, so what really happens now then is, well, there's the video. Now let's go back to this video and to whether we should have cameras in the courtroom. But that whole discussion itself was a fascinating discussion to learn what was going on. And, and just that alone said, hey, this guy doesn't have any disorderly conduct, you know, for, for up to them. He's done nothing wrong. Okay, let, I need to focus a little bit here. Okay, so uh, let's look at that video. If we did not have that video of Don Mashek and the sheriff, we wouldn't know how accurate that sheriff's testimony was, would we? We wouldn't know. Uh, but since we have the video, we know that the sheriff's testimony wasn't accurate by what he said because he said there was a lot of conversation that took place between telling him to be quiet between the sheriff and Don and when he told him to get out of the room. And that did not take place. So the video, even though you don't have the volume, it, it showed, um, and this is a different video here, um, and I can't go, go back to the other one, but with that video, uh, we have a better idea of what happened and who was more accurate and giving their testimony. So everybody in that courtroom, so the respondent, uh, you know, I'm gonna have to go to back to this video here. So, <clears throat> let's see if we can do this, figure out how to do it here. I gotta, okay, there it is. So we have these players here. This is uh, the respondent plaintiff in this particular harassment restraining order case. Um, there's another respondent. They're cross-suing each other in a harassment restraining order. Uh, she testified she heard nothing. Okay? All this is going behind her. She didn't even know what happened. She didn't see the or hear the sheriff get up and do anything. Didn't hear. Didn't know there was a note being passed. Uh, earlier in the day behind somebody. Uh, Del Nathan said he never heard uh, Don Mashek uh, say anything, um, couldn't hear him. Uh, so, I, I mean, w without, and yeah, no, no, nobody heard anything. So you had three witnesses in the courtroom and the other man on the other side of Don Mashek, he testified. He was the one that passed the note, not somebody else, not Don Mashek. So you had people in that courtroom that said the this, this sheriff deputy wasn't telling the truth. Okay, so um, let's go find the other video here. And this is outside the courtroom, okay? And eventually, you're going to, you, we're not going to show all of that right now, but eventually, I'm not going to show it right now, but eventually, if you can follow my cursor here, you're going to see Don and the deputy come out down here. But mind you, there's a couple other cameras down at that end of the hallway, okay? But that they said it didn't cover that section. But here's the deal. Don asked for all the videos from all the cameras during the time he was at the courtroom the whole day. That was interesting. And what I just showed you, and I'm about to show you here, which is about six minutes long, or I'm not going to show you the whole thing, that's all he got. But he was there the whole day, and he was going up in between different courtrooms, and this is all he got. It, it's fascinating. Um, why, why did that happen, and why did they tell him the video was missing? 
you know, or destroyed beforehand. Okay, so uh, the sheriff, I mean, it was just interesting testimony he gave, and then what the rebuttal or, or the cross examinations, and then the other people testifying. Uh, the guy just got confused on everything. Uh, it was very clear. The other people in the, that were in the courtroom were very clear. Nothing happened, <laughs> you know. Uh, all of a sudden, the sheriff is doing this stuff, and they're not figuring out why. It just didn't make any sense. <clears throat> all right, but here's this camera. So what Don did is asked for the video because we knew there's video in the courtroom. We knew that from the Michelle McDonald, the Supreme Court candidate's case, when she was arrested in Dakota County for taking a picture in the courtroom while the court was in session, was in recess. And of course she got found there was no probable cause to arrest her, but then they treated her really, really bad. So we knew there was cameras in the jail. We knew there was cameras in the courtroom. We knew there was cameras in the hallway. We knew all that. Um, and Don immediately, after his arrest, asked for all these things from whoever he could and however he could to get that done. And he was even in a hearing at the court, one of his first hearings, where he said, there's video of what went on, and those videos will show that I have done nothing wrong. I want those videos, but the prosecutor here is not, he's going to have them destroyed because there's a process of saving the videos, and it's not taking place. So with, these, with this, I, I got to get them, and I got to get a copy now. Otherwise, I fear they're going to be destroyed, and the evidence to show that I'm not guilty of disorderly conduct will be gone. And it's just going to be my word against the police officer's word, and that's very hard to overcome. And I heard that judge, and I was in that courtroom, and I heard that judge says, Prosecutor, you're going to save the videos, aren't you? And the prosecutor said, Yes, absolutely, and we're going to do that. Okay. And so then the prosecutor comes out, not during, you know, later on after that hearing and said they're going to preserve the evidence, they're going to give it to them right away before the next hearing. Well, they didn't do it before the next hearing. They didn't even do it after that, the hearing after that. They did it five days before this hearing. Uh, they gave the video. But that's because Don forced his public defender to file a, a motion to drop the case because they destroyed exculpatory evidence. Okay, but it took them two other hearings to get that motion into play uh, because of the processes up there. And then the public defender really didn't want to do it. And I was in, the, I was in that meeting where <laughs> I just was flabbergasted where the public defender was saying to Don Mashek, well, they don't have videos in these courtrooms. And the people that were in that in that uh, little meeting just laughed at the public defender. Of course they do. We know they do. And then now the whole, the whole issue of how they do cameras in the courtroom, that was testified about today. And that's what was also fascinating, where the chain of evidence, there is no pattern for the chain of evidence. There is no routine way that they protect evidence in the courtroom. And we heard testimony from uh, one of the, uh, the guy that runs the system as to how they preserve this chain of evidence. And, and the answer is they, they really they, they don't preserve the chain of evidence. And a lot of people can get the video. So what happens? And you're in this courtroom, and let's show this picture here. These are motion-sensitive cameras. And I, I forgot to ask my uh, producer this question, but this was a fascinating thing. These cameras start up 15 seconds before there's motion in the in in the in the hallways in the camera. But what they the man said is, so how does a camera start recording before there's motion when it's a motion sensitive camera? But what the man said, the cameras are always on. Okay, but he said they're already 
they're, they're recording. But then he said, they're, they're on, but they're not recording. Well, what I took it to mean was, they're not recording, but they're always recording, and if 15 seconds go by and there's no motion, then they delete that. But they always have 15 seconds of video showing and recorded. So, okay, so it's always recording. They only trigger saving data to the disk when motion uh, okay, the key word is trigger, sa trigger saving data. Okay, so it will then save the data to the disk once the motion is detected and then, then it will go to that prior 15 seconds. Uh, so that was interesting. Uh, and then it, if there's no motion after 15 seconds, the camera stops recording the data um, stop saving the data, okay, I until it gets triggered again. That makes sense to me. I, I understand that and how that could happen. Um, so this is the hallway here, and of course, remember, Don Mashak asked for all the video from the whole day he was there, and he only got that one section in the courtroom um, and did not get any more than this piece. So I'm going to play this piece here just to show you this. The, Don's going to end up, and it, it's just, I'm just sorry, this is as good as the video is, and if I were to bring this bigger, you wouldn't see it, but this is what they recorded, even though there's, in my understanding, a couple cameras down at that end of the building, up in the top or left-hand corner. Um, they did not give him the videos of that area because the head security guy said, well, there's no information on it uh, and didn't think it was necessary to give them. But he doesn't get to make that call, which is one of the big questions. Who gets to make that call? So we're going to go about three minutes into this um, video here. Because that's where you're going to see Don start coming out. Okay, remember we're looking up here and you see people going down the hall there. They just opened the door up there. And the sheriff and Don come out. Of course, you can't really see much. Uh, and then somebody walked by, no big deal. Uh, where did they go? They just disappeared. Oh, did I? Yeah. Interesting. I, did you see that? In other words, there was a person there that was walking by. Let's see if we get this going. There. No, that's, that's that one. There was somebody before that. Okay, here they come out again. We're going to show this over. They're coming out of the courtroom. And now there's a conversation going on here, and the conversation is basically this. Okay, here's this person walking, and stopped and gone. Whoa, ha, that is interesting. And then somebody else comes out, but here's this conversation going here and well I don't see him anymore yeah he's still standing there this is off to the side the conversation was Don was saying what's your name and badge number and and Don's a repo man he he knows how to control himself and his temper and his language and there they go into they just went into they, he arrested him and put him in the, in the holding cell right there. So that's, I mean, the rest of this video, and you can come back to me. We'll just leave it in the background here of the TV. Um, uh, so it keeps playing to see if Don comes out again. But they were out in that hallway for a very, very little bit of time. And, and during that time, um, the conversation was, what's your name and badge number? 
and, and Don used his techniques to try to get that information. What's your name and badge number? So part of the conversation and the cross-examination was, officer, what's the protocol when somebody asks you for your name and badge number? And the officer goes, well, we're, we're supposed to give it. Well, when are you supposed to give it? Well, I, I don't know. Uh, I decided to wait till um, a later bit of time. And uh, so, well, do you give the name and badge number after five times that they, they ask? Or do you, you know, when, when do you do that? And the first time Don asked, the guy says, I don't have my card on me. But that wasn't the question. Uh, so they, they waited till after they arrested Don, and they arrested Don because he kept asking, what's your name and badge number? And then the officer says, well, he raised his voice. But that's not, that's not disorderly conduct. The officer wasn't even afraid of Don. Testified that. So, I mean, it's, it's a bar, bizarre situation. One person that testified was one of the persons that was walking through the hallway, who was a public defender herself. She said, hey, I, you know, I, I see a lot of things happen in the hallway in the courtroom. And there was nothing that happened there that drew my attention to this conversation. I just noticed it because I noticed things. I was busy doing things. I saw them out there talking. I saw nothing out of the ordinary. Now, out of the ordinary, <laughs> that was interesting because she just didn't give a real clear answer. She sees people getting arrested in the hallway all the time, you know, people getting warrants served. We, she gets yelled at from her clients. You know, she sees people actually physically yelling and loud. And what did she see here? She said, I didn't see that. That would have been a lot better for you to hear her testimony than me <laughs> telling you uh, what, what happened. Uh, so uh, I, I think it's fascinating that, you know, this is what we got for the videos. You see the importance of the video? because it gives a time perspective of what actually took place. Because when you hear the testimony of the officer, you think this took quite a bit of while. But here it was less than a couple minutes from the time they walked out of the courtroom, in the courtroom, walked out till the time he was arrested. Nobody in the courtroom said they heard anything out of the courtroom, outside the courtroom. Nobody outside the courtroom, the one witness that was on the stand, said that they there was anything unusual, and she was asked the question, did you think it was disorderly conduct? Well, a public defender goes, well, I, I don't, that's a legal, that would be a legal determination, and I, I don't make that, I, 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 not to make those things. Well, yeah, did you think it was disorderly conduct? And it, she didn't answer it, you know, because she's not going to make, you know, it could have been clear. You know, we know what disorderly conduct is, and the statutes are, are clear as to what it is, and obviously it didn't rise to that. So would you rather have seen the video of the hearing and the testimony than have me tell you? I would have. I like my show better when you have video <laughs> rather than just me talking because I think the video does a better job. Uh, so... Uh, what also happened with when this, uh, the director of the uh, Mitchell Sne uh, Selner, he's the um, employed by Dakota County as a security consultant. And so all cameras are, are on a separate service and they're recorded to a separate service. And what they do is they've tested them out and they go and say, uh, okay, Based on the average volume of people we get through the courtroom, we're going to adjust the server so it stores data um, for at least 30 days. If there's less traffic in the on and off of the recording, it can go longer, but it's at least going to be have 30 days of storage. And then what they do with that information, it's being stored there, they go out and and uh, if somebody makes a request for that video, 
they make a copy of that video and then give it give it to the requesting officer and then the officer is supposed to put that with the file to give to the prosecutor. Well, that never happened in this case. The videos were requested, that's why they were preserved, okay? And that's why they were able to get, I mean, this is just like the Obama and the, and the IRS uh, emails, you know? Oh, we don't have them. Oh, but we got them deep in the system here, you know? So they're, they're, they're deep down in there, and we dug them out. You know, we were able to capture all these emails. This is the same situation. They had the videos all the time, and they knew it, okay, because the guy saved it. They were saved. Okay. Oh, the IRS said the hard drive crashed? Yeah, <laughs> okay. I, you know, I, I, I doubt that. You know, but that's what they said. But they still had it on, a, on another backup system. So um, when asked to be maintained... We then, so they're on a separate server, but when asked to be reserved, maintained, uh, uh, saved uh, for future years, they go to a different, a separate system, a, a separate hard drive. And they're put over based on the request of the clips. And so he had gotten a request, only he didn't know who it was from. And so, uh, you know, so it's archived someplace else. He archived it, didn't know who the request came from, and the public defender goes, what do you mean you don't know who it came from? Somebody makes a request for video and you don't keep track of, this is called chain of evidence. You don't keep track of who asked for it and then who, who it was given to? And they go, No. That's a big, big problem um, that's going on there, and that's a procedural problem uh, that they need to fix. Um, so they save it for 30 days. If it reaches its capacity, then it will start deleting, you know, any information, but they've set it up so that it at least saves 30 days. Um, so if, if they got 40 days of things saved and then the hard drive reaches capacity, then the first in video that came in is the first to go out. So, but never less than the, the, the last 30 days. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, did you receive a request to preserve evidence? Yes. When did that happen? I don't know. So they didn't even make a record of when it was asked to preserve the evidence or who... Um, uh, who requested it. <clears throat> uh, is there a standard practice as to what you would do, was asked. Um, save it to a separate server if requested. I'd give copies and, and, and make a copy and give it to the person who requests. And he did receive a request that week, but he doesn't know who it came from. I mean, this, this, is, a, this is a big thing. Uh, uh, why that isn't known. I mean, this, this is serious. This is why I call the show Speechless, <laughs> that this isn't happening. Do you, do you get that? Uh, maybe I'm overkilling it here, but I, I mean, as over, saying it over and over again, but it just blows my mind that this is taking place. So it was saved. They did have it. The, the evidence, at least what the officers requested. But Don, before the 30 days was up, was doing a public data request, was asking all people that he could ask in, in the court system to preserve the information. And the answer he got back was, it's been destroyed. So one of these days I'll have that paperwork that shows it's been destroyed, that they said that to him. Uh, it's been deleted. Um, you know, I mean, this is a serious question. You got to think about this and you got to take it personally to heart and apply it to you as to what would happen if it were you. If your liberty and your freedom from jail was on the line, would you want the evidence saved and available? Yes, you would. You absolutely would want that. And Don's freedom and liberty and reputation is on the line. Don Meshek's. 
and the county attorney and the county and the sheriffs <clears throat> are playing games and not being straightforward. Yeah. Why is the question? Why do you want to do this? Who's, who's pushing the buttons here to, to uh, make this happen and to make it so difficult for him to defend himself? It's, they're conspiring to deprive him of his liberties and his right to defend himself. And they have the evidence, and they didn't give it. And it's amazing the prosecutor goes, well, Don, did you get your videos? So how can you, well, you got your videos, didn't you? And Don goes, no, I didn't get all my videos. And that was another thing the judge was doing that was really bad, really, really bad. Eventually the judge said, because people weren't, answering a straight yes and no questions. There is no such thing. There are yes and no questions, but there doesn't have to be yes and no questions. So if somebody gives you and says yes or no, I want this question answered, you say, you ask that person, did you stop beating your wife? And if they say yes, that means they were beating their wife, and they say no, they're still beating their wife. It's not a yes and no question, and not, not a yes and no answer. It could be, but it isn't always. And this judge was just telling him, don't elaborate, just say yes or no. And the public defender should have said, hey, Your Honor, they're asking a question. The question isn't totally correct. Here's the real answer. The goal is to get to the answer of the truth. And so they may need to elaborate on it more. But the, but the public defender didn't do that. Um, so here's the thing. The prosecutor does have this responsibility to make sure that the exculpatory evidence is provided to the, the defendant, the person being charged. They have that responsibility. And, it, and we hear of cases over and over again where prosecutors withhold exculpatory evidence and people go to jail for a long, long time. Evidence that they know would get the person off. And they don't give it. And Dakota County, you're doing it. And with your prosecutor there, uh, Mr. Colburn, and, and the other prosecutor from the city of Hastings, Frugal, Flugel, you know, you guys are scamming things. Now these are the same guys that prosecuted Michelle McDonald who was found not guilty of DUI, uh, but they prosecuted anyway. Just think of how much money the city of Hastings had to spend to prosecute, and the city of Hastings is prosecuting Don Mashek, to prosecute him and to prosecute Michelle McDonald. And these people are being, and Don will be found not guilty. Okay, there's no way he's gonna be found guilty in this thing. Uh, but the city is spending tens of thousands of dollars to do these prosecutions and they're not, and they know they weren't guilty. So what's really going on? I don't know. Who are they trouble, trying to cover up for? Are they trying to save, these prosecutors trying to save their own skin and to protect police officers and sheriffs who are bad actors in order, and just to protect them because if they don't protect them, they don't have their job and they get talk bad about you know what what's deserved here is somebody to go talk to the city of Hastings and say here's what your prosecutors are doing here's what your police officers and your sheriffs are doing in this county and it's costing you and your citizens money you need to know what's going on okay uh, so they went into a lot of the details to when the camera stops and starts and it has to you know it's got to have motion within at, at the farthest range, 30 to 35 feet. Uh, so if you're moving down 60 feet down the room, it, it's not going to start the camera, uh, even though you were there. So um, that's that's the big thing about that hearing. The hear to me, the hearing, the most fascinating thing was not Don being charged for uh, or you know, not the disorderly conduct and the testimony that was going on. I mean, that was a big thing. We, we knew the testimony 
in itself will get them off, but finding out how these videos work, you know, and um, <clears throat> the cost of putting the prosecution to put on a hearing, well, we, we had the case in uh, Little Canada for uh, Andrew... Um, Ah, I'm going to forget his last name. Uh, Holmgren, not Holmgren. Yeah, Ho Andrew Holmgren, I believe, who took a video of a sheriff while she was out in front of his apartment building uh, attending to, at that time, a medical emergency. And he filmed it, and he didn't know it was a medical emergency at the time. It didn't matter whether it was or not. Um, and so she destroyed the evidence, and they still prosecuted him. And he got found not guilty. It cost the city of Little Canada about $5,000 to prosecute him, but he was fortunate to be able to get the ACLU to defend him, and that cost them money. Well, here for Don Mashek, the public defender's office is defending him. So this is all a big taxpayer expense all the way around and can end up resulting in people losing their job in other lawsuits related to that because of uh, um, negligence and the cost to the taxpayer. This taxpayer shouldn't put up with this kind of garbage from police officers and sheriffs and prosecutors. It can cost them jobs and if they didn't like the way they were fired or, or let go, uh, there could be lawsuits around that. Uh, so it's a very expensive proposition, and for a little thing, you know, uh, whispering in a courtroom. But that he wasn't even charged. It was all everything out outside the courtroom, you know, where a person was asking for his right for the officer's name and badge number, and he wasn't going to give it to him. We didn't even get into the aspect of what happened in the when Don was in the holding cell and he was the sheriff there threatened to uh, beat him up and and he can shoot him in the head and then um, the next day he'd have his job back you know because he could justify shooting him I mean the abuse by these guys is unbelievable all right we got a little bit of time left uh, here uh, anything more on that hearing? Well, I'd, I'd like to hear from you. What do you think about cameras in the courtroom? Um, because they say, oh, you can't have cameras in the courtroom because, you know, it's going to make everybody upset and they're going to change their testimony. And uh, <laughs> we see here that without cameras in the courtroom, testimony was changed. You know, the, the sheriff was saying something different than what actually took place. And then they matched it up with the, the video, uh, except that they didn't. He didn't match it up with the video. So the judge is going to take two weeks to decide and uh, what took place there. Two weeks to decide, excuse me, the, the um, public defender sent a letter saying, um, or wrote a memorandum and, and then is going to make his closing arguments. He's got two weeks to get those in. Then the prosecutor is going to respond to the closing arguments and, uh, and he's got two weeks to get those in and the judge will take two weeks to decide whether the charges will be dropped or not. All right, we got a phone call. Caller, do you have a comment or question? Well, you had asked for us to uh, call in with our opinion as to whether or not there should be cameras in the courtroom or not. Okay. And I'm a practicing attorney, and I believe that for most cases, there should be cameras in the courtroom. Mm -hmm. And the reason I say that is, for the most part, once you're in the courtroom, I think the cameras become... If they are there, they would be invisible to most people who are there because they're thinking about the case at the time. They're thinking about what's going on, and I think that if they are playing to the camera, that would become evident to either the jury or the judge that they're playing to the camera. Right. And certainly a good attorney could also expose that if they were playing to the camera. 
and in in trying to preserve what is really going on, I think cameras are important for accountability. So that's all I have to say. All right. Uh, thank you. Can you think of a situation where they wouldn't? What kind of situation shouldn't you have cameras in the courtroom? Well, there may be some cases that are confidential cases that maybe you might still have cameras there, but it would, the film footage might only be accessible uh, under certain conditions. Um, I, you know, I, I guess I haven't really thought that through, that yeah. there may be some situations uh, where you've got uh, something having to do with a, a minor or uh, perhaps a paternity case, those cases that are confidential today, um, you might have to have some other kind of additional uh, safeguards in place if you did indeed al allow cameras in the courtroom. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's, it's a, you know, in Minnesota you can't, you can take, they don't record the appellate court, they record the Supreme Court, they don't record the appellate court, but you can film there. If, if you ask to film, they'll let you film. Um, I, I really can't think of any reason myself, because the bottom line is, whether it's a juvenile case, um, you, you say you're protecting the juvenile, well, what if the juvenile's lying? You know, and what if the judge and the attorneys are fixing a case? I, I can't, the, the whole thing is you have a right to public trial, and that's in a criminal situation, but the whole thing is to have transparency. And I think the risk of getting it wrong by having a camera in the courtroom, the person can pill that if the camera made a difference you know, and they didn't get a fair trial. But I think by having in the camera in the courtroom it is the guarantee of a fair trial. Uh, because that was the purpose of having public hearings and public courtrooms is so having it public was the guarantee for a fair trial so people can see what's going on. There was a sidebar. They came and they had a discussion and nobody here can hear what the discussion was on the sidebar. Were they talking about administrative stuff? Well, why is that excluded from being a public discussion? It should be a public discussion. Because they were asking about whether some evidence was admitted earlier in another hearing or whether it wasn't, whether it's forgotten, how to get it back in. Why shouldn't we hear that? Bottom line is what the prosecutor was saying, the public defender messed up by not introducing that evidence earlier. And it's not in the record, so now he's got to try to get it in some other way. Well, and the prosecutor comes back and says, I mean, you got to really strain to hear this. Um, well, I did have it introduced. And so, but why wasn't this just, why a sidebar? Have it all open. Nothing back in that back courtroom. Okay, we got another phone call. Caller, do you got a comment or question? Yeah, Tim, I, had a, I have a question, sure. and this goes along the lines of the camera in the courtroom. Okay. And I've always wondered, in today's advanced society, uh, technology being what it's been for decades now, it's absolutely, for lack of a better word, asinine that we do have a stenographer up there recording all the valuable <laughs> information that they could possibly change and have in the past. And that's the query that I have here is, how high up do you think it goes, Tim, where this has been stopped, uh, thwarted? Because they definitely have kept this system for the absolute purpose of being able to change the minutes of the court. And have you ever thought or do you have an opinion on that, just how high up they go to get these orders down to remain with a stenographer rather than a camera? Your opinion, please. Yeah, well, very... Very great question. Um, at the Supreme Court, Minnesota Supreme Court, it's all recorded. Um, and they don't have a stenographer. They, they just record it video and audio, and they play it on the website. You don't hear the backroom discussions of when they're trying to make the decisions, but you see the written order there. And the appellate court, 
they don't have a stenographer, so that's all recorded, but you can't get a recording of it. Uh, but they record it themselves for the audio, and you can't get a copy of that recorded audio, nor can you get a transcript of an appellate court hearing. So the fact that they let you film it now, I think, is a big deal, but you got to go in there and do it yourself. And, and they'll let you. Uh, but there's also other parameters. They only let one person film, and they got to disseminate that information to somebody else. Uh, at the district court level, they are recording them, too, and they have the stenographer. So it depends. I think it's just kind of been left up to the courtroom itself. But this whole aspect of changing the transcripts and having a stenographer so a judge can say, leave that out and, and change the transcript and you know, record it differently. We, you know, we've seen that happen. I, you know, I know of many cases where that's happened. So, um, very good question. Why don't they just record it and then go off the recording? I think they should. And then be, give the recording to both the prosecutor and the uh, defendant. And, and they got that recording and uh, there's an official record for the court. Not that that can't be changed either, but there's a way to secure that information. All right, great question, uh, interesting show. It's a problem that needs to be solved and addressed. Let's make the system better. Remember, if you don't stand up for other people's liberties, who's going to stand up for yours? And good men don't do nothing. God bless. Have a great week.